The following program is brought to you by Caltech. Oh, great. Thanks, Michelle. Well, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Glenn Litzy from the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, Glenn holds the position of fellow of the W.R. Woolrich Professor in Engineering in the Department of Aerospace Engineering and Engineering Mechanics at UT Austin. He is the founder and director of the Satellite Design Lab there, where he and his students design, build, and operate satellites. Uh, both undergraduates and graduate students are involved in that work. And his research program focuses primarily on the technology of small satellites, including uh, guidance navigation and control, attitude determination and control, formation flying, satellite swarms, uh, as well as satellite networks and cooperative control, including proximity operations. Um, the group has also worked on uh, global GPS uh, receivers, radio navigation, propulsion, satellite operations, and spacecraft systems engineering. Uh, so with that, I'm very pleased to, uh, to welcome Glenn. Thanks, Charles. <laughs> well, great. Thank you, everyone, and thanks uh, to the Institute for uh, sponsoring this. This is a great opportunity to bring everyone together. This is something I've really been looking forward to for several years. Um, as Charles mentioned, I'm a professor at the University of Texas. Uh, this is actually a picture of the launch of our satellite, uh, two satellites that were together on the same actual launch vehicle that RAX-1 was on that Jamie was talking about. There were actually were uh, six or seven satellites on that one launch vehicle. And uh, it was kind of amazing. I mean, you hear about you know, rockets that don't work. Uh, on that one, I believe every, every single satellite was successfully deployed and communicated and did its part of its mission. So. Um, you know, very successful mission. Um, this is an incredible experience to work with, you know, tens of students to have them uh, build stuff with their own hands and uh, then to actually see it get launched into space. And I, I worked at NASA earlier and uh, it was always very exciting when things launched, but it was even more exciting when there were students. Uh, so it was very, very, very great to be able to provide that opportunity and it's something that really is only possible with small satellites. So uh, I was very eager to present uh, today. And uh, so when the committee asked me if I would present, I was very happy to do that. And I said, that's great. What can, what can I present on? And they said, well, how about capabilities of the small sat platform? And I sat back and said, hmm, that sounds like a pretty big topic. I don't know if I can do uh, justice to that in 45 minutes, but I'll, I'll try. It's uh, really a, a, almost like a survey talk, and I'm going to cover as much as I can. I'm sure I'm going to leave a few things out, so apologies in advance to anyone if I left your uh, great mission out of the talk. Um, my career uh, really started at NASA. It's actually been about half at NASA and half at the University of Texas. So I've kind of witnessed a lot of this and been involved in some of it. So Google is a great thing. I started doing a little bit of research, and I was like, well, what, what can we say about sm small satellites and kind of what's been done before? And of course, uh, we all know that you know, the earliest uh, satellites that really, really began the space age were small satellites. So you know, we can trace our heritage back to that. There's this feeling, and I'll show you a plot in a minute, that uh, it justifies it, that there really was kind of a gap where there really weren't any small satellites for a long time, but even then, small satellites really featured prominently. In fact, it was uh, small satellites that were the uh, S uh, Strategic Defense Initiative's brilliant pebbles, which was this kind of early, uh, early launch network that was going to tell us if a nuclear war started and help us uh, prevent it. And uh, that was Star Wars that really kind of ended the Cold War. So small satellites had a prominent role in the end of the Cold War. And here's a picture from JPL in 1988 of something the size of a hockey puck. I don't know if you can see that dimension, but it says 15 centimeters. And we see inside a whole bunch of circuit board-like chips and a camera. Uh, and they were going to launch a whole bunch of these, like maybe 100 around Mars and take pictures. So you know, the idea of small satellites is not a new one. In fact, I don't want to read too much from these slides, but let me spend a second to read this. 
There is a class of science and exploration missions that can be enabled by micro spacecraft and feasible with larger spacecraft. Examples include a global network of surface or atmospheric sensors, <coughs> sounds good, measuring the spatial and temporal structure of the magnetosphere about the Earth, Sun, or other regions of space, sounds like a good mission. And three, using micro spacecraft as distributed arrays for radio or optical signals. Wow, this all sounds really good. This could be our workshop. This was a workshop in 1988 called Micro Spacecraft for Space Science. So see, even in 1988, people were talking about the, this. In fact, this workshop was held at Caltech JPL in October 1988. So 24 years ago, people were meeting here talking about almost the same subject. Which brings the question, what can we take away from this, uh, that we're having this workshop? And I think there are a lot of ways of looking at this. The complementary way is great minds think alike. And you know, the people in the 1980s had great minds, and we do too, so we're all thinking about small satellites. Another way of looking at it, slightly less optimistic, is that the best ideas have already occurred to somebody else, and so we're just sort of re retracing someone's footsteps. It's a little bit uh, depressing to think about it like that way. Perhaps a more neutral way of looking at it is that when you have basic ideas, um, they lead to similar solutions because the physics are the same. And uh, finally, if they wrote a good report, we're done. We can like, you know, the weather's really good. We can go like turn in their report. <laughs> and you can see we have, you know, good leadership here that's set setting an example for us. Well. 24 years is a long time, and I do think uh, some things have changed. So I went back and did some uh, digging, and some of this is, uh, is, is very informative, and some of it's kind of sad. Um, the population has increased. Uh, things have definitely gotten more expensive. I really have no idea if you would consider these better or not. <laughs> Moore's Law has been operating this entire time. It's about 2 to the 12th over 24 years, and that actually works out within about a factor of 2, to be correct. And a lot of people told me that Moore's Law was going to break down in the 90s, and you know, we're still going strong. Um, if you could buy a share of stock back then and hold it, this is what it would be worth today. So you know, just imagine your 401k composed of Apple stock, and that's what you could have. And maybe the government should have done that, because <laughs> actually that would have been a great way to pay off the US debt, which has increased about six times. NASA's budget has been roughly the same. It's gone up and down a little bit, not really changing uh, too much uh, in, in scope. But its share of the US budget has gone down, almost by a factor of two. And that's because the US budgets in general has gone up. Uh, what is, I think, really interesting is this stat down here. Now, this is kind of old now, about 15 years ago, but I bet it's not changed very much. If you just ask people on the street how much of the federal budget does NASA get, the answer turned out to be 20%. <laughs> and this is, this is the gap we have. This is why people are so upset with NASA, because what are, what are you getting back for your 20% of the U.S. budget? So what does this all mean? Well, it's, you know, there's reason for concern here. Uh, first of all, everything has gotten more expensive. Our purchasing power has definitely decreased. Space funding has decreased. The manned space program is grounded. It doesn't get much more depressing than that. Um, and you know, all of this means we must be at least as impactful as before in terms of doing science with less resources. But if you're an optimist, it's not all bad. A lot has happened in electronics. This has just been an amazing revolution in electronics over the last 25 years. And mass production has made these very powerful devices that you could really only dream about uh, very affordable. And launch systems are more accommodating than ever before for small sats. And, just, and, and uh, uh, it was referred to earlier uh, by Andrew, would you rather have one of these or one of these, right? So this is just way cooler, right? Um, so. Uh, it's not all bad. Um, in fact, if you look at electronics and what we can do today, what the consumer electronics industry has provided, it's a pretty amazing list of capabilities, all of which are very relevant to satellite missions. Low power processors that draw microwatts uh, or you know, milliwatts, uh, fractions of a watt. ASICs, custom system on a chip modules. This, this is a system on a chip module that 
not only has uh, one core, which might be an older computer, but this one has 15 cores on it, on a chip. Not only that, but it has all the uh, I.O. It has a lot of I.O. features to go along with it. So you can combine all these different functionality into a single chip. Uh, RF circuits, you know, the list goes on. Batteries, solar cells, I'm not going to read them all. But these are all very directly beneficial to the SmallSat program. But it doesn't do everything. Uh, consumer electronics really are not ruggedized for an environment like space. And so ultra-reliable electronics, the basic problem, if something breaks on the ground, you pull the card out and you replace it. It's a little hard to do that at 500 kilometers altitude because once that rocket's gone, you're probably never going to see that satellite again. Uh, so you have to design for very reliable systems. You have to potentially consider radiation based on your orbit. LEO, as we know, is not too bad, but uh, it's still something to consider. And if you go to higher altitudes, more, it's definitely more of a consideration. You have to have in-fault tolerance uh, because, again, you're going to be at some inaccessible place. So you have to have some ability to recover from a fault. Jamie talked about signal isolation, what a big issue it is, especially for small satellites where everything is packed in. Um, Synthesized satellite operations. What I mean by this is, you know, most of the consumer electronics are not thinking about uh, a satellite. They're thinking about a cell phone or, uh, you know, a desktop PC. And so they're not really synthesizing all these different systems for a satellite. So you have to do that. And, you know, finally, there's really no good substitute for systems engineering. And so you can get all these great electronics, and if you don't have good systems engineering behind it, your mission still doesn't work. So the bottom line is, and it was 25 years ago that we had this workshop, and this could, the, it, our parents could have been there, but the small sats we have today, these are not our parents' small sats. So we can do things that they could only dream about. Um, of course, this is the motivation. And I apologize if some of this talk is kind of introductory, but um, I'm, I'm trying to address a wide range of uh, you know, people with different backgrounds. But of course, uh, you know, what is it that makes getting into space hard? And predominantly, it is the cost and the availability of launches. Launches are very expensive. At least traditionally, they've been very hard to get. The projects take a long time. You might spend a decade of your life working on a single mission, um, as uh, Sriram said this morning. And uh, there's a lot of risk aversion. And so all of these things are barriers, basically, to getting into space. Well, let's look at small satellites. Small satellites essentially address every single one of those barriers head on. They're like the perfect uh, you know, answer to all these traditional barriers. Because the satellites are smaller, they cost less. They can be designed faster. The, the vehicles can be standardized, and therefore the launches can be standardized. There's shorter time to la launch. There's the ability to take more risk. All of these things favor the rapid turnaround, quick missions. And this scale, which was in a journal publication uh, by Sandow, shows um, the size of satellites by their mass, correlated with program cost, correlated with time to launch. And what you can see is that small satellites occupy the lower half of this chart, so or the left side of this chart. So everything is much more smaller, more affordable, and faster with small sats than with some big, huge uh, you know, flagship mission. Well, let's settle on what we mean by small sats, because there's a lot of confusion about naming. And I myself get this mixed up from time to time. So we have a large classification of satellites that we can call small sats. And it really is, uh, and this line is somewhat arbitrary, it really is about everything from about 100 kilograms or less. And that really is stuff that can be accommodated as a secondary payload. So microsatellites are sort of classified as 10 to 100 kilograms. This could arguably go up to like maybe 180 kilograms. That's the mass limit of an ESPA ring. Um, but keeping with this kind of order of magnitude thing, nanosats are 1 to 10 kilograms. This is where your CubeSats would be. PicoSats, this would be like a 3U CubeSat, this would be like a 1U CubeSat uh, and smaller. And then uh, even these Femto satellites, which are these you know, milligram chip sat things. 
Um, so most of our CubeSats that you've heard about are in this, in this category, whether they're a single unit cube or something bigger. And these are just pictures of random satellites that are in those different sizes. So CubeSat, everybody here probably knows what a CubeSat is, but just so we're all on the same page, or in case you don't, um, as was mentioned earlier, this standard was sort of created by uh, professors Twiggs and Fuxwari at Cal Poly and Stanford. And it was created really for their own needs to do their own uh, educational missions. And lo and behold, it was a standard that worked very well for everyone else too. And now we have more than 50 missions launched to date. And I've heard that there could be as many as 100 launched this year. So we really see CubeSats taking off. And what has really made it work is the standardization of the interface and the adoption of that standard by the launch vehicles as being willing to incorporate that in their in their uh, launch vehicles. And, um, and, and even though currently really 3U is the upper limit, there are 6U and larger, which arguably are not CubeSats anymore. They are microsats, which are on the books. So if you need a little bit larger form factor, you can get that too. Of course, if you go as a secondary payload, you have to, you get some, you get some great advantages and then you have to accept some things. The great advantage is very little cost for your mission for your launch, fractional or no cost, depending on whether you pay it or someone else pays it for you. Um, you can get to orbits that might otherwise be inaccessible or very expensive. Uh, for example, uh, rocket boosters going to GEO can provide a launch at a very uh, reasonable cost compared to you know, build, uh, buying your own rocket to do that. And they often park those spent boosters out at Earth escape. So you might even be able to escape the Earth's orbit. Um, however, of course, you can't necessarily pick your orbit or launch date. You have to be willing to work with that. And as Jamie said, sometimes that's tough for you to do. Uh, you have to conform to the deployer and the launch vehicle standards. Um, you have to pose minimal risk to the primary payload, which might mean things like you can't fly a hydrazine propulsion system, even though you really wanted to. Um, and you're usually going to work with an intermediary. You're not going to work directly with the launch vehicle provider. Here are some examples. This is uh, a CubeSat launcher. This is a Peapod, but it's, I want to note that there are other commercial products out there uh, that are roughly the same size. Isopod, the Isis uh, has one that's called an Isopod for in Europe. Uh, this is an ESPA ring. An ESPA ring is much bigger than a CubeSat launcher. It, it can hold, a CubeSat launcher can hold, you know, up to 3U four to five kilograms, let's say, uh, and an ESPA ring can go up to 180 kilograms. So this is much more for a, a nanosat. And this is a, 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 a rocket adapter plate. This is a Vega rocket, which is, a, I think, a Russian rocket. And so you can see the typical situation that we have. We have the primary payload. This is the guy who's actually paying for the ride. They get to sit up on the high throne here. And uh, then you have all kinds of stuff just shoved around it. Here are three separate CubeSat dispensers, and you have uh, an ESPA ring here with a microSat, and all this stuff is going off on one launch. So this is much more what a con t uh, current launch today looks like. And I've seen uh, CubeSats that were on rocket nozzles, and you know they put them everywhere. So you never know what environment you're going to be in. Um, this is a famous plot that just shows. Now this is for nanosats. So let's go back to our naming convention. These are satellites that are one to 10 kilograms. So this isn't capturing all the satellites, but it does follow, they all pretty much follow a similar trend. You have a lot of interest and activity, especially in small sats in the 60s with the beginning of the space program. And as missions got bigger and more expensive, um, you know, basically people lost interest and we got away from our roots. And then right around here, and you can see this corresponds very well with that 1988 workshop at Cal Poly, we start to, I mean, at, here at Caltech, uh, we start to see uh, uh, some launches of nanosats in the 90s as people are kind of learning how to do it all over again. And suddenly it takes off and you start to see this big growth here. And this is the sort of modern CubeSat era. And actually if we plotted this in 2012, I can't wait to see what this looks like. It's going to have about 100 over here. So we're going to have to use a log scale or something to keep this going. Um, okay, that's kind of my introduction. I want to talk about uh, some specific missions 
that I chose. Uh, I can't obviously go through all of them, but these are ones that I think are interesting for different reasons. And uh, they're, some of them are microsats, some of them are cubesats, uh, some of them are missions from the past, some of them are missions in the future. But they will kind of give you a sense of what is possible with small sats and what the state of the art is and where we're headed. So the first one is Orbcom's MicroStar. I think we have to pay our respects to Orbcom, not because it's dead, but because, uh, because it was a great, uh, really pioneering mission. Um, it's a microsatellite, uh, and so 50 kilograms, and this was done in the 90s at this time when we were just re returning to doing things with small sats. And the idea was to provide a commercial communications data service from low Earth orbit with inexpensive satellites. And in the end, the cost of each satellite, remember this was done in the 90s, a lot, not a lot of um, uh, mass production. Everything was kind of custom. They had to pay for their own launch vehicles. Everything uh, came down to less than $5 million each, which is still pretty good. And they were able to leverage this economy of scale. They have this assembly line of all these microstar satellites. And so you can see the design. It's pretty interesting. It's like a, a Frisbee or a can of sardines or something. Um, and on the sides are these solar panel arrays that open up. So this is where you get your power from. And down here is a gravity gradient boom and UHF VHF antenna that drops out. And you launch a whole bunch of these on a Pegasus. Here's about eight of them or 12 of them that launched at one time. And they go into several different orbit planes, including one or two over the poles, so you get global coverage. Very autonomous network because it, could, it was too expensive to manage each satellite individually. And uh, it's been used for a lot of other missions, which I think is, is a good role model, that you build a bus and then you're able to use it for m multiple missions. So good first example in small sats. Still very relevant. Um, SNAP-1 is another satellite to think about. It was an amazing satellite, I think, for its time. It was launched around 2000. And uh, it was built uh, uh, supposedly with less than a million dollars in internal funding. I'm not 100% sure if I believe that. It was an amazing satellite. It was a Pico satellite, 6.5 kilograms, very much like a 3U a little bit bigger than a 3U CubeSat, triangular <coughs> prism form factor. Remember, this was before the P-Pod and the CubeSat standard. It uh, had a full attitude control system with reaction wheel and magnet torquers, very advanced for something that small. It also had a butane thruster, which provided a small amount of delta V. There was actually a requirement not to have a propellant tank on the satellite. So they didn't have one, they just had a big long tube that they stored all the propellant in. So that is actually the propellant tank there. <coughs> had an imager and uh, yeah, so, so small set people are very clever. They're also clever at getting around requirements. Um, and uh, beautiful mission, just flawless mission. Imaged, uh, this is an image of the launch vehicle that they separated from. They also did some relative positioning, very coarse, but nonetheless one of the first to do it with respect to another satellite. And it really shows if you know what you're doing and you have experienced people, you can really pull off an incredible mission for not a lot of money if the launch and other aspects of it are, are taken care of. I have to talk about Fast Track simply because this is a UT mission. and I would be uh, slapped if I didn't put like a, a, one of our own missions in here. Um, Fast Track, though, is an interesting mission because it was a completely student-built and tested and launched mission. And a lot of people felt you couldn't do that. Remember the, the quotes we saw about that can't be done. Well, you know, even in 2005, 2007, I think there were naysayers saying, you know, students can't build a satellite and have it really uh, work and perform an experiment. And not only that, um, we built these two satellites. These are two satellites that go up together, they separate, they perform cross-link and relative navigation, and we study the orbital dynamics between them. Um, uh, not only that, we built both of these flight units for less than $250,000, not because we wanted to, but because we had to, because that was all they gave us. And, uh, you know, this is less than one reaction wheel on Shree's satellite. So just so you know, small satellite is a different, it means different things to different people. I and mean, there's, there's scales of an order of magnitude that could reasonably be called small sat. It isn't that cheap, though. People always say, well, you're, you're fudging because you're hiding the personnel costs. And the university's good at doing that because we have a lot of free student labor. 
And if, if we have been studying this, we had a student actually working on a master's thesis on what are the real costs of a university satellite program. And we estimate about $2 million in personnel costs. So you know, a lot of times people get into this kind of lowballing game of, you know, you can build that satellite for $500,000 or less. It's like, remember that song, Name That Tune? You know, I can build that satellite for $400,000. Well, you've got to be careful here. I think you've cut too many corners and you don't do anybody a favor because a satellite that doesn't, uh, isn't, isn't appropriately handled isn't going to be successful. And the NanoSat CubeSat program, as a point of reference, is about a million dollars. And I think that's a, a, a doable number. Um, well, how did it work out? Well, this is data from our mission. I don't, I don't have a whole talk about our mission. Uh, we actually will be talking about it at the SmallSat conference. But this is uh, actually thousands of GPS position fixes from uh, GPS receivers on both satellites <laughs> that, um, that we actually built those GPS receivers ourselves. So, uh, the, the mission's been very successful, and we, we, we had six uh, mission objectives, and we've achieved all but one of them. And we're uh, now 20 months into the mission, so almost two years of operation out of these satellites that cost less than $250,000. Okay, NanoSail D um, and LightSail. These are interesting because these are solar sail experiments on CubeSats. NanoSail D went six months from concept to deployment, so rapid time to development. Uh, as a project uh, managed by Marshall Space Flight Center. Dimensions, three meters by three meters. Here's actually a picture of NanoSail D with some of the instrument designers. Of course, this is really a, a deployable experiment because getting this packed inside 2U of a CubeSat is an amazing packing job. And so this is, this is obviously really where the challenge is with these solar sails, getting really large surface area. And Planetary Society also has a mission called Light Sail 1. So, so NanoSail D, after they got it on orbit, and this is Fast Sat, this is Marshall Space Flight Center's microsat, not, not to be confused with Fast Track, which is ours. Um, but after they deployed it, and there was some excitement about that. Oh, and by the way, I could tell you lots of stories about things that we had to fix on orbit. So just like Jamie said, you know, one thing I was a little worried about is after we launch it, is there going to be any engineering to do with my students because, you know, it's on orbit now? Well, guess what? All kinds of things went wrong. You know, the radio wouldn't work, the antennas wouldn't deploy. There was just tons of stuff. And uh, we troubleshot our way through everything. I mean, the students are amazing at figuring out solutions. Anyway. Back to NanoSail. So yeah, there's stories there about them getting deployed, but once they were deployed, the, sat, uh, the solar sail worked beautifully. It was ejected from fast track, fast sat, see, even I can't get them straight. And, um, and after 240 days, it re-entered. So this is a case of, of basically accelerating re-entry with a, with a light, a solar sail. Light sail one is interesting because it's a, an orbit raising mission. So they're going to go to a higher orbit, which of course is what most people with so, interested in solar sails are really interested. In, and this should launch fairly soon, within a year or two. QB50, another mission, very interesting because it's, it's a global international mission. And, and basically, someone said, let's, let's study the atmosphere, the thermosphere, using uh, CubeSats as basically markers. And we're just going to put a whole bunch of them up there. And we're going to create this open forum program where everyone who wants to can, uh, or up to 50, can build one of these uh, 2U CubeSats and then we'll launch them all at the same time and basically watch the orbits decay and learn something about the atmosphere. And this, gets, this has an incredible outreach component because everybody who wants to, and there are countries all over the world and similar to what was said about Colombia having its first CubeSat, you have all these countries, Lithuania and other people, they're just incredibly excited about getting their first satellite into space through this program. Basically, someone else has to fund the CubeSat. The, the program will not pay to fund the CubeSat, but if you bring them a CubeSat, they will launch them on a submarine launched Russian rocket. I found this very interesting. It uh, brings back uh, images of Cold War, um, but this is a <laughs> converted rocket that's going to launch 50 of these all, all at one time as, in a string of pearls. They're going to use Genso, which again, as we've talked about, is kind of the way of the future, this global network of ground stations for data collection. 2015 launch date, not that far away. Phoenix, uh, an incredible forward-looking mission. This is also known as the zombie mission 
because the idea is you're bringing satellites back from the dead. And uh, of course, Phoenix rises from the dead. This is a DARPA project, and the idea is that it's very expensive to build and launch apertures into geostationary orbit. You have these big, huge apertures for communications and remote sensing and reconnaissance. And they're way out there at GEO. It was very expensive to get them out there on the order of maybe a billion dollars. And maybe for just a few hundred million, a few, uh, you can recover these things once they have become inoperative. And by glomming on small sats, which could potentially be CubeSats, in fact, one of our proposals was to use 3U CubeSats for this, um, you can replace functions of the satellite, such as the guidance and control system, the radio, so forth, that have become inoperative. Very interesting mission. We've got bigger satellites working together with smaller satellites, cooperative, old satellites, new satellites, formations, networking, a lot happening here. It's, it's a DARPA hard problem. Uh, very interesting. There should be a tech demo in the 2015-2016 time frame. It would be very interesting to watch that. Lots of other examples. You know, just use your imagination. Um, you could have all kinds of imagers, uh, bolometers, you know, interesting science, earth science. Most of these are earth science because uh, we're really looking at what can we do from LEO, but you can do a lot of really great space science from LEO, so by all means, and we're going to hear uh, th at this afternoon from some uh, ideas, you know, go crazy with uh, ideas on space science. Um, networks, you know, rapid response things, maybe you wait until there's a solar flare and then you launch a bunch of CubeSats. Why couldn't you do that? Um, expendable elements, things that burn up because they don't cost a lot of money, so you just replace them after they uh, expire. Um, payload return, why not? Especially if you're interested in things like space debris, um, formation flying, or you know, bringing something back from the moon or from, the Mar um, from Mars. Why not if it rides on another vehicle that has the delta V? So lots of potential ideas here. This is kind of the primordial soup that we can bring all these interesting missions out of. Also, interplanetary missions, why not? Um, and Rob Staley is here in the audience, and he has a NIAC uh, for interplanetary CubeSat missions. And as he himself will tell you, NIAC is usually for kind of crazy, far out ideas. And lo and behold, this one turned out not to be so crazy or far out. There was a workshop last May. Many of you were there at MIT where we had a whole workshop on this and lots of participants. And this is Rob's chart uh, that he presented. Uh, and he has several interesting mission types, you know, sample return missions, solar physics, pretty much any kind of science you can imagine. The CubeSat has the potential for you to get into space as a piggyback on some other mission. You aren't going to have the delta V to escape Earth orbit by yourself, but if you're on a satellite that's already going to the moon or Mars or somewhere interesting, then you can, you can essentially, you know, double your science with another s small satellite, potentially. Okay, those are just random ideas for missions, kind of showing you where we've come from and what the state of the art is. I also want to talk a little bit about the community and what sort of opportunities are out there for small sats. And this is not an all-inclusive list. I'm sure that I've left some things off, especially some DOD things. But, um, but these are some programs that you might want to be aware of, not only if you're interested in looking for funding to start your program, but also um, if uh, just, just to see kind of where the level of support is. So the first one is the University NanoSat program. Uh, we participate in this at the University of Texas. The idea behind this is 10 university finalists are selected uh, from an open competition and uh, they then receive funding for two years at not a very lot of funding, 55,000 per year. So you're really doing this on the cheap, but um, you have the opportunity to um, bootstrap a university satellite student program. And uh, if there are a lot of universities that have never done anything in space, and yet they have a lot of students that are really enthusiastic. And the Air Force will actually train you. You can go and learn spacecraft technician skills and all kinds of great things. If you win, you get a promise to receive a launch. So out of these 10, and I'm, uh, there are winners, and the winners um, get these launches into space. And so these are previous winners. Uh, this program started about 2000, and uh, the program uh, kind of starts over every two years. So we're up to NanoSat 7 now. But you can see the winners over the years. And uh, uh, 
uh, of these, uh, here's Fast Track. This is our satellite. This is how we got into space. We won this competition and that provided our launch. Over here we have pictures of the satellites. Most of these are nanosats. They're not CubeSats yet, although there are a lot of CubeSats in this year's competition. In fact, uh, ours is, our design is a CubeSat as well. So I expect we'll start to see CubeSats here and we may see potentially more than one winner because it's more cost effective to launch CubeSats or you can launch several CubeSats for the price of one nanosat. So um, the blues are the ones that have made it into space and the yellows actually have been launched but the rocket didn't make it into space so unfortunately three corner sat didn't make it to orbit. So Fast Track was actually the first one out of this program. A lot of other ones you see kind of in the pipe, CUSAT and Dandy are both I believe uh, manifested or very close to being manifested, so they should be going up soon. The Edison program, many of you may have written proposals to Edison. Um, Edison is a, a specifically uh, from the Office of the Chief Technologist, dedicated to uh, small satellite demonstration missions, mainly technology demonstration missions. But uh, you know, if you can do science while you're out there, that's a bonus. Um, uh, <coughs> The f this program is really just getting started and the first selections will be made this year, in fact, maybe even the next month or two. The first call had these three areas uh, chosen as focus areas, so you can kind of see where the Office of Chief Technologist's uh, interests lay. Close proximity operations using small spacecraft, so you know, if you can get spacecraft to perform tasks together cooperatively, that's really empowering. And so, in order to be able to do that, there's a whole host of proximity operations, sensing and algorithms that have to be developed. Um, in space primary propulsion, of course, being able to maneuver your, your small sat, or in this case, it actually calls out CubeSat is very important. Um, and uh, communication systems, you know, especially if you're gonna be in interplanetary orbits, communication systems are critical. Um, so, and here's PhoneSat, right, which is also part of the Office of Chief Technologist. Uh, the launch, CubeSat Launch Initiative, also known as ELANA, is, is the provider of launch vehicles through NASA for CubeSat missions. And basically you write a proposal, which the call for proposals comes out about once a year in the fall. And if you are selected, they will provide a launch for you on a P-Pod up to a 3U CubeSat, nominally for free unless you don't show up, in which case you pay $30,000. So there's sort of a $30,000 fee if you don't deliver your satellite. They don't pay for the satellite, right? You have to find your own funding for that. But the universities have been, I think, very effective at going out and getting separate funding, and then they use the Alana program as a way to get a launch. <coughs> and to show you the interest in this program, up through three years now, we've had 65 CubeSats selected for launch here. This is more than the entire, probably, amount of CubeSats that have been launched to date. So we expect to see a lot more CubeSats going into space through this program. And all of these in blue were launched into orbit successfully, and there's racks. Um, and these were also were on the um, uh, Glory mission that didn't make it. So you can see that not making it into space is a big part of this, and you know it's part of the space business. And even when I work with my students, you know I'm, I'm tell them, you know, hey, there are no guarantees, and uh, that's that's the nature of the business. You see, you know, mostly CubeSats here in these pictures of the hardware. And you see some of, by the way, you see racks and dice. Some of the uh, uh, NSF missions were launched through Alana. Um, so this is the NSF program. It now has a long title. It used to be Space Weather, but I think they've broadened it out. And uh, these are all the focus areas which really have anything to do with atmospheric science. So if you're going to want to study atmospheric science from space, the uh, so, uh, NSF program is a great way to get going and a great way to have, uh, get about a million dollars to build and launch your own cube, 3U CubeSat. And so you can see a couple of them made it into space. I don't know if any of these others have. I don't think they have yet. But if somebody, somebody knows, let, you can tell me. Um, okay, those are, those are programs. I want to give you kind of a survey of technologies. Personally, I'm kind of a technology person. I like to focus on all the pieces of the satellite. And these are things that I think are important for small sats to enable small sats to be able to do progressively more effective missions at uh, lower price points. So especially on things like CubeSats, integrated guidance and control is, is important because you have such a small volume and can you get 
say, arc minute or arc second attitude control out of that system. I, you know, five years ago, it, it was not really possible. Today, we're almost there. I think we're within a year or two of achieving this. Optical sensors, there's all kinds of interesting imaging you can do for engineering and science if you have working optical sensors. Thrusters, this is a really cool idea based out of rapid prototype material. You know, if you're working in a small volume, you've got to use every square or every cubic centimeter. And this rapid prototyping technique, and the, the, the thruster is actually made out of the rapid prototyping material. So it flies in space. Not only does it allow you to cool, you know, carve out cool uh, functions like this is a converging, diverging nozzle, but you can conform to whatever volume you have available. Radios, low power radios, compact radios, optical comm, kind of you know, the holy grail, but you know, this is really would open up that communications bandwidth issue that Jamie was talking about. Deployable structures, antennas, apertures, uh, solar sails, inflatables, and in the long run, I think low thrust devices uh, like solar sails, but also ion thrusters and things like that. Okay, um, so uh, this is my last slide. And basically, you know, this is the title of our workshop, Small Sats for Space Science, or Small Sats, a Revolution in Space Science, which is, is a pretty powerful statement. And the, I really prefer to just ask it as a question, is now the time for small sats? Uh, small sats are not new. We've had small sats since the beginning of the space program. But there is reason to believe things are a little bit different now. We have economic factors, you know, mainly tighter budgets and technology factors, being able to do more in a smaller form factor that are making small sets more popular. We are getting more capable platforms. The idea that this is purely an educational activity is really something that should soon be in the past. Th these are serious science capable platforms. And uh, the deployer standards are making the launches very affordable, which is really the most expensive part of getting into space. But I think we have to really look carefully at this question because uh, a lot of people levy this against the small sat community. And I think we have to be careful that the physics actually motivates a small sat solution. We don't want to just develop small sats as a solution in search of a problem for which there is no you know, science uh, problem that small sats address. And that's, that's really what I hope to get out of this workshop because I'm looking for that connection between the engineering and the science. So we need great science ideas for you scientists. We need the engineering muscle of Jamie and Andrew and people like uh, uh, me that can build these satellites. And we need programmatic leadership from NASA and DOD to pull off to make this, make this a reality. So will small sats bring a revolution of space science? I hope so. Um, the bottom line is it's, it's our future. You know, we are the ones, we are the stakeholders in this. And uh, whether or not this happens, we should not be looking to someone else to do this. This, this is, this is our, our thing to, uh, to make or break. So let's, let's take advantage of it.